Hey everyone, I'm Seven Investing Lead Advisor Max Chatsko. Uh, I cover biotech and renewable energy here at Seven Investing. And you might not have heard of me too much on the podcast because I don't do too many podcasts. But Simon's been twisting my arm behind the scenes, and so I thought, hey, you know, I uh, let's let's uh, kick this back off and get back in the podcast game. And what better way to do that than to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is synthetic biology. So individual investors might have heard of this term over the years. Um, you know, in the early 2010s, a lot of industrial biotech companies were pursuing biofuels. They were making engineered microbes, uh, pursuing these large gargantuan fuel markets. And for technical and economic reasons, it just didn't work out. A lot of those companies went bankrupt. Some pivoted and are still with us, like Amaris or Codexis. Um, and many more have pivoted. And then, you know, just over the last 10 years, it might have seemed kind of quiet uh, but really behind the scenes, you know, in the private markets, a lot of companies were building new technologies or specializing in specific areas of the market. And that's kind of built like a much stronger foundation uh, for where we are today in the beginning of this decade. So just in the last year, you know, we've had, uh, it feels like a second wave's coming. Uh, we have Zymogen recently went public. Inco Bioworks is about to go public. And these were two of the best funded startups in the space. So to get a better understanding of synthetic biology, there's really no one better to talk to than Drew Endy. So Drew, thanks for uh, taking some time out of your day to talk to me. Max, uh, great to be here with you. Thanks for inviting me to join together today. Yeah. So Drew is a professor at Stanford and he was previously a professor at MIT. And he started the bioengineering degree programs at each of those institutions. He's also a co-founder of the iGEM competition. IGEM stands for International Genetically Engineered Machines, and it's where universities from all over the globe get teams of students together, and they compete against one another uh, to design something with reproducible biological parts in different fields and tracks, and then they come together for the Jamboree in Boston every year in the fall, and they get judged and scored and ranked, and there's award ceremonies, and it's a beautiful thing. Uh, and Drew, I could keep going on. Your, just the highlights from your career would be like 10 pages long. Uh, so I guess the best way to put it is I consider you the godfather, one of the godfathers of synthetic biology. I hope you haven't sold the movie rights yet. Yeah, I mean, when things when things um, happen, there's lots of parents, you know, and um, uh, I think you're touching upon some stuff that's really meaningful to me, um, be mostly because it's about the reality of how much can be done with biology, how much can be built with biology, and uh, we need people to do that, and and you know it's like I helped start the programs at MIT and Stanford, and 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 that was a great experience. But many people helped with that, and and the beauty of the iGEM competition, if you, if you've never heard of synthetic biology, you know maybe you've heard of a software competition or a car building competition, but imagine a genetic engineering competition, and and that's that's what we've got. You know the the iGEM is is. Eh, maybe 6,000 students a year now, uh, 400 schools. It's actually moved from uh, Boston to Paris um, and is, is home base there now going forward. And one of the things we're working on behind the scenes is how do we make that not 6,000 students a year, but 600,000 students a year or 6 million students a year. And thinking about the infrastructure that has to be developed underneath the educational activity. Um, of course, what's amazing about students, you know, um, I can't remember an anecdote I got from uh, Jim Plummer, one of the previous engineering deans at Stanford. It was either from Hewlett or Packard who related to him that the best thing about Stanford was it brought students to Silicon Valley and then they left the university and went and did actual things. You know, so, so then one of the neat things about iGEM is people have the iGEM experience and then they, they go do actual things. So I think about Ingrid Swanson and um, you know, the iGEM project from the University of Washington that then became a startup company, PVP Biologics, that was um, invested in by Takeda out of Japan and eventually acquired. Uh, they had developed a new protein therapeutic for treating um, uh, gluten intolerance, you know, and so and so that was an example of a, of a student project. You think about student projects in software going from a classroom to an acquisition or a market success or a real success in less than a decade. But it was Ingrid and her project with PVP that was like in less than a decade, they went from an idea and an iGEM project to a half billion dollar acquisition. And so it's just like, huh. Um, and you mentioned Ginkgo in the opening. And, and of course, I know those folks well. You know, that's another example of an iGEM project growing into 
uh, a corporation um, that that's still ongoing. Um, yeah, but anyway, great great to be here. You know, good morning from California. Yeah, growing list of companies uh, that have started as projects, or at least the team met or had like were the project from iGem. Uh, I judge that competition every year. Is it so? It's actually in Paris. I didn't. I'm, I'm out of the loop. I got to go to Paris if I want to judge it now. It's been a strange time, right? I mean, we're all we're all reeling from the one nine, and so um, you know, the big decision last year was whether or not I should. And so there was there was obviously not a physical jamboree in Boston, where you know you didn't want to bring five thousand people to the Heinz Convention Center, you know, and have a super spreader event. Um, and so the the jamboree was actually virtual. Um, and, and it was a success. I mean, really good projects were done all over the place. It was tricky. Like the Stanford, the Stanford team in 2020 for the iGEM, they decided to work on um, diagnostics of, of viral pathogens, um, obviously inspired by the pandemic. And the question they asked at the start was, why do I have to go somewhere else to get a test? Um, if I'm infected, I'm infected right where I am. So, so why do I have to go somewhere else? Or why do I have to take a sample and send it somewhere else? Couldn't my body just tell me if I'm infected? And so they developed a project called SEED, um, Self-Replicating Embedded Environmental Diagnostics. Um, but I call it the Purple Booger Project. Sorry to be so blunt. Um, <laughs> imagine you have a friendly microbe living in your sinuses, and it's sampling the nucleic acids in your environment, infecting you. If nothing's infecting you, your mucus is a normal color. If you're infected with an influenza strain, your mucus turns bright orange. If you're infected with a coronavirus strain, your mucus turns bright purple, right? Like I'd rather have a real-time, runtime, all the time diagnostic platform telling me what's going on with me. So th that's their iGEM project. We couldn't get them into the research labs on campus because of the county shutdown, the public health shutdown, but they ended up doing their experiments in the, the DIY biomaker space in Mountain View. Um, and, and we're able to get enough preliminary results that we brought that back into the hospital's catalyst program and they've been doing ongoing research to bring that forward into a new company. You know, so like, yeah, like iGEM's happening, but so strange everywhere. So, so it went virtual, but it's still happening. It'll be virtual this year. And then probably in 2022, that's when we might feel comfortable getting people back together. But I defer to you, like, are you ever going to travel again? Oh yeah, I can't wait. I uh, really want to really? get back out there and tour factories and facilities. You don't? You want to stay all cooped up? Well, you know, like I'm not really cooped up, as you can see. Probably, <laughs> you see that. Right? So, like, <laughs> I I'm pretty happy never traveling again for work. I I can imagine that. Real, real, real fine. I, I like I like traveling at light speed. This is much better. <laughs> all right, so maybe uh, let's back up at a few steps, and yeah. you know, maybe we'll just start off with one of the simple questions because our our audience is a little more generalized. Um, and it seems like a simple question, but what is synthetic biology? And you made a recent presentation where you kind of took issue with the interchangeability of terms. And I love that yeah. because I always hate that we use the term biotech and biopharma interchangeably. Uh, in yeah. the public markets, you know, uh, biotech is applied to any small drug developer. You don't even have to be developing a biologic drug. It drives me absolutely insane. I don't know why we can't be more precise with our terms. So you said, hey, you know what? There's engineered biology and biotech and synthetic biology, but these are all distinct things, and we shouldn't really shy away from that. You know, we should hold up synthetic biology uh, as its own approach to biology. So, uh, what the heck is synthetic biology? What makes it different from everything that came before? Yeah, th thank you for that, Max. And um, I'm with you a lot. You know, I think I think a lot of people are um, lazy um, <laughs> for reasons, right? But but um, that's so it's okay, but it's not okay. Um, so, so let's start with, gen I'll give you, there's sort of two answers to your question, um, but I'll give you the engineer's answer. So, so let's start with genetic engineering. What's genetic engineering? Well, genetic engineering starts with the ability to cut and paste DNA. And that was pioneered in the 1970s with recombinant DNA and um, gives birth to the biotech sector as we know it, starting around 1980. And so, so genetic engineering is based on this core tool of cutting and pasting DNA. Um, around the same time, two other tools appeared. One is called PCR for polymerase chain reaction. And that lets you take a, a small amount of DNA and just make lots of it so that you can work with it more easily. So that's a second tool in the toolkit. Um, a third tool that appears in the mid to late 1970s and really gets going in the 1990s is sequencing of DNA. The ability to take a molecule of DNA that's a physical object and read it out so that you have an abstracted representation, the letters or bases of DNA, the A's, T's, C's, and G's. So, so I would say 
you know, first generation of biotechnology is powered by these tools of genetic engineering, recombinant DNA, polymerase chain reaction, and DNA sequencing or DNA reading. And, and these are the, the, there's other tools, of course, but these are the, the, the new tools that appear starting from mid 70 to mid 90s that really impact workflow and change what people can do. <clears throat> so that's all great. That's not going away. That's powering a whole bunch of activity, whether it's pharmaceuticals or agricultural or materials manufacturing. But, but there's more tools, right? You know, it's like things keep getting developed. So what are the tools in the toolkit that synthetic biology brings to the table? The first one is synthesis, synthesis of DNA. So synthesis of DNA gets worked out from um, a chemistry perspective by 1980, and it gets commercialized by the mid 80s. Uh, applied Biosystems and others were making beautiful machines, DNA synthesizers that could synthesize short fragments of DNA called oligomers or oligonucleotides that, that you know, might be 40 letters long or 100 letters long. Um, a, T, T, A, T, A, you know, 40 of those letters. Um, and by 1985, ABI, Applied Biosystems, had captured the market. Uh, they were selling the machines. They were selling the, the, the chemical cartridges, the ink for the machines. They were selling the service contracts. And they shut down their, they shut down their R&D team because they had solved DNA synthesis. <laughs> um, now, now, you might not know about applied biosystems or your audience might not know about them um, because um, they're not around anymore. Uh, they got acquired and then they, th that thing got acquired and so on and so forth. And, and I didn't know about any of this until I went to a meeting and was showing up saying, hey, synthetic biology would like even better DNA synthesis. Um, what do I mean by that? So, so when I first started teaching um, at MIT in 2002, um, one of the things we wanted to do was take inspiration from the work of Lynn Conway. Uh, now, Lynn was an electrical engineer working at Xerox Park back in the 70s, and she was working on semiconductors and semiconductor design and manufacturing. And uh, she and Carver Mead recognized that there was a lot of um, expense associated with the fact that in order to get a chip built, you had to really know the people at the chip foundry and follow their rules to get something built on their fab. And if the people operating the lithography systems were a little bit hungover, you know, maybe the masks didn't totally align and good luck with that run. Um, and, and so she and Carver figured out how to decouple the design of, of, of integrated circuits from their manufacturing on silicon. And uh, this gave birth to the VLSI revolution, the very large scale integrated electronics revolution that then leads to the microprocessor. So, so we were talking with Lynn about what she had done to figure out how to decouple design of electronics from manufacturing of electronics. And, and, and parsing those lessons, we, we took that back and said, we're gonna do the same thing for the biotechnology workflow. You are gonna be a designer of DNA Max and I'm gonna be the builder of DNA. Like you're the architect, I'm the contractor. And by specializing, we'll be able to do more together. That's the gist of it. Um, does that make sense just in, in general at like a high level? Yeah, it does. Um, okay. uh, that's a good uh, so, time. So, so, so I, I, I know I'm giving, I'm, I'm giving this, ex let me loop back to like synthetic biology, but I'm just trying to explain sort of how we got here. Um, so DNA synthesis turns out to be a key tool that would let us decouple design of biology from construction of biology. Because if, if, if I could get DNA synthesis working really well, you could be the designer and I could be the builder. Uh, so that's tool number one of synthetic biology. Al although it was implemented as chemistry in 1980, the practical reality of accessing DNA synthesis as a tool was not mature and is still maturing, right? Twist being a pioneering example of that. But so let me make this real for you. When I ordered DNA in 2003 for a gene, the price of that is $4 a letter. Right, so every time I press the T key or the A key or the C T or the G key on my DNA printer, I'm, I'm spending four bucks. Um, and a gene is gonna be a thousand letters. So a, a gene encodes an enzyme that might do one thing. So every time I'm doing like one little operation in a cell, it's $4,000 just to print the DNA. Um, one of the things synthetic biology has done is celebrate DNA synthesis as a strategic technology and improve that technology. So the price of building genes is now down by about a factor of 100. Um, although it's interesting, we should talk about this, it's actually coming up in price uh, over the last couple of years. Um, so that's interesting in, in terms of the economics. Anyway, 
We got recombinant DNA, PCR sequencing. Now we're gonna have DNA synthesis, DNA print, and then there's two more things. One is uh, coordination of labor. How do I do something where I am so that you can use it where you are without having to talk to me? So this is enabled by standardization that allows for coordination of labor. We see this all over technologies, whether it's the stone aqueduct in Segovia made from regularized blocks or the fire hydrants and hose couplings that are standard so that if the city over there is burning down, I can bring my fire truck and help. Um, so standards allow for coordination of labor. That was the second big idea uh, that makes synthetic biology build on top of genetic engineering. And the third big idea is abstraction. So um, abstraction is an abstract concept. Um, uh, here's how to think about it. When, when you send an email, you're not like programming zeros and ones into the computer. You're using these high level functions that get compiled down into the physical reality of the electronics. And there's an abstraction stack that does that down compilation with high reliability. Um, biology is super complicated, right? So we could immediately pivot the whole conversation into TAATA, -A -A, CGA, CTC, CGA, CTC, -A -C -T -A -T -A, GGG, AGA. Like, what's that? You know that? Hey, you know you know that sequence, right, Max? You know what that does, right? <laughs> no idea. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a cons it's a consensus promoter for the T7 RNA polymerase that initiates transcription. And that's the sequence they use to make the RNA for the COVID-19 RNA vaccines. You got to get that polymerase going. But, but like, who wants to memorize all those sequences? I only know a few because I only have so many computer login passwords. Um, but, but so instead, you just want to say, like, that's a go, sig that's a go signal. You know, that, that's like a make RNA signal. So that's abstraction, like this idea that you can manage complexity. So let me zoom out. Synthetic biology builds on genetic engineering by improving the workflow, DNA, con DNA, DNA synthesis to decouple design and fab, standards to enable coordination of labor, and abstraction to manage complexity. If we can advance these things, and we have now, then the complexity of things that can be made and the routinization of the manufacturing process, meaning I really mean the prototyping of the biology process, not the downstream manufacturing, you know, that, that can be uh, just better managed. Um, and, and yeah, blah, blah, blah. No, that's great. And I think, you know, reproducibility and the standardization is such an important point to emphasize. You know, if we took uh, the analogy of a jet engine, a modern jet engine is a very complex piece of machinery, and there's thousands of components. There's a lot of different uh, engineering fields that go into that, right? Advanced material science engineering, fluid mechanics, thermodynamics. But we can design you know, modern jet engines because we can model them on a computer. Uh, we can plug it in. We can you know, know the air coming in, uh, how many rotations and thermal expansion of the blades so they don't blow up and hit the sides And when you're at 30,000 feet into a million pieces. We know the temperature of the air coming out of the back. And that, you know, the ability to model a jet engine is really key to being able to build these modern jet engines in the first place. So if you're an, an investor, just a, someone out there who's not really tuned into biology, you've never worked in a lab, you know, you might think that a single cell is actually a very a simple component of biology, but it's, it's not. Um, you know, a single cell's orders of magnitude is more complicated than that modern jet engine. Uh, and we still don't have the capability to model even a single cell. Uh, so what are some of the obstacles there? Or what are some of the advances we need to make uh, in order to really be able to model a cell and, and gain this kind of uh, you know, mastery of biology? That's a good question, Max. And it's a research question, right? So, so as an aside, the other definition of synthetic biology is, is learning by building in a scientific context. I'm just gonna acknowledge that and then come back to your question. So, so you make a good point. Let me read it back. Um, the fundamental unit of life is a cell. Uh, this is the object that's enclosed in a membrane that's got DNA, it's got you know, biochemical functionality, it can move oftentimes, it can do stuff. So all of the life we tend to think about from microbe to person to plant to tree, you know, those are made of cells. And to your point, there is no cell that's perfectly understood. Like not one cell on earth is perfectly understood. There's, there's not one cell that's fully modeled, there's not one cell for which every component inside it that's essential to the cell working is understood. Um, I just want to pause there and acknowledge that because of that reality, you see various commercial activities adopting certain configurations. And, and so the way I describe it is they, they are going to be Edisonian. Uh, they're, going to be, they're going to be getting better at tinkering and testing. Because you can't perfectly predict or model how the actual biological system is going to behave, 
you operationalize that by saying, we're going to try a lot of things as smartly as we can and then see what works and then build on that. Right. So, so that, that the significance of the fundamental ignorance in biology, meaning we don't yet completely understand the fundamental unit of life, means the commercial sector is going to be Edisonian. Right. And, and the big capital investments into platforms are our reaction to that reality. As a, as a researcher operating an academic lab, I spend a lot of my time like I live. My job is to live 10 to 10 in the future, 15 years in the future. And so we're thinking about how do we fill in that fundamental layer? How do we get to full understanding of a cell? So that you know the the commercial sector transitions from tinker and test to more rational design at the cell scale. Um, I would say that we're at the starting line of of doing that. Um, meaning, for the last six years or so, uh, my lab and others all over the world have been working through what's the problem with not fully understanding cells, and I should say problems, and what new tools do we need? to figure it out. And, and you're right to pick up on modeling as one of the issues, uh, but there's also issues of measurement and, and just making. Um, everybody, I, I would bet many people be familiar with, um, what is it, the nursery rhyme, Humpty Dumpty? Yeah. You know, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall, had a great fall, all the king's horses, all the kids couldn't put it. So it's like, if, if you took, like, uh, one of the things we can't do today is I, I can't take a cell and take it apart and collect all the molecules and put it back together and have a cell again, right? It's just like the things aren't in the right places. I can't physically do that. I know I have all the things that are sufficient, but I can't do it. So, so that's an example of like a type of fundamental challenge. Another challenge, and I don't want to belabor it too much, um, like what math do we use to represent the behavior of, of molecules making up cells? You talk about an airplane. Well, that's going to be what math do we use to represent uh, the flow of air or the wing through the air, it's going to be fluid dynamics. And fluid dynamics complicated math, but it's been, it's been complicated math we've been working with for centuries. And so we have a good mathematical framework that we believe is well grounded in the physics. And then we use the digital computer to throw numerical integration methods at it. And so we can design an airplane on a computer and build that thing and it flies, right? Like the test flight is the first flight. You know, so, so, so that's because we have the modeling framework right. The inside of a cell is very different. It's like, um, imagine a burrito, but the burrito, all the things inside your burrito are, are independently moving around spontaneously. And so it's this like self-mixing burrito, and yet it has order. And so, and so the, math is, the math is very different. And it's, we now know what the math is. And so we've basically been porting over math from colloidal biophysics and for the like I had a student defend his PhD on Tuesday of this week and it's, it's the first time in that defense I'm like yeah we've got the we've got the modeling framework to do forward design of cells like he's emitting he's emitting designs that I think will work when we build cells like you could make a cell go faster or slower or whatnot and it's it's the physics engine feels right it's like a video game it's like the you know the video game like has a physics engine and like is the physics engine any good and I would say 20 years ago physics engine sucked for cells, right? For modeling cells. And like this week, I'm feeling like we've got the right, we've got a pretty good physics engine upgrade. Um, yeah. So, so anyway, I, you know, the 1960s had the space race and this was about uh, humanity for the first time getting up out of the gravity well of the earth. I think the 2020s are going to have the life race. Nobody's really using these words except for me right now, but that's okay. But, but by, by life race, what I mean is this is going to be the decade where we, the scientists and engineers working in synthetic biology, learn how to build a cell and cells from scratch and operate them. Um, and, and I think that could happen in, as soon as um, a thousand days, so Thanksgiving 2024. Um, like we're, we're at the starting line now of the life race because we have the tools that we can use to solve the problems in terms of building cells. Um, and, and so that, but that's more of a fundamental con, 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 you know, comment. Um, I don't think that's showing up on the marketplace yet, but I would be very surprised if the market of 2030 and 2025 wasn't being influenced by, by just filling in the fundamentals of bioengineering at the cell scale. So let's live, uh, let's keep going 10 years, 15 years in the future. Um, one thing about biology is that it's inherently scaled down, you know, um, it already operates at the micro scale and the nano scales. 
And and this kind of gives, you know, it points in the direction. And the, ma- and the macro scale. And the macro scale. <laughs> and that, You're yeah. right. You're right. It's a yes end, right? And at all scales, right? Right. And um, so maybe the building blocks, I should say, right? At the micro and, and nano scales. Yep. Um, yeah. Now, you know, I guess so like the analogy would be, you know, the 1950s, you know, computers took up the size of a room. And now we have personalized computers and, and smartphones in our pockets that are basically supercomputers, you know, from 60 years ago anyway. Um, and in biology, it seems to be moving in that direction, right? We, like it's inherently, uh, you know, predisposed to being distributed. And that looks quite a lot different from anything we have today. You know, like today we have personalized computers. Maybe in the future we have personalized synthesizers or something, right? Like you can send me designs. I have a, a pest in my vegetable garden and you can send me some topical that's going to only target that pest. Uh, so w- w- what does that future look like? I mean, how far away were we from that or... Um, and does that interplay with some of the commercialization of biology or does it disrupt it or kind of both? Yeah, th- thank you for those questions, Max. Um, so biology teaches us in nature that all atoms are local. Uh, a leaf doing photosynthesis is getting the photons where the leaf is. It's getting the carbon from the air where the leaf is. It's getting the water and stuff from the soil. So biology teaches us that all atoms are local. This implies that we can build locally. Um, We can build very sophisticated things locally to the extent we have biotechnology that can be deployed locally using the atoms that are local and the energy that's local. Um, This is mostly not the world we live in today. We live in an, in the West, we live in in an industrial economy that selects for centralization of manufacturing and industrialization of biotechnology. So, so the type of biotechnology we have today, I would call industrial biotechnology. We don't have the personal or the local biotechnology to a great extent. Yet, the first principles analysis would suggest that biotechnology eventually has to be local too. I don't think it's an either or situation, but I think it's a yes and situation. It, you know, we're gonna have big fermenters in Minnesota and we're gonna have the possibility of distributed biomanufacturing. Now, now I'm going to call that a possibility right now, because, uh, frankly, you know, the United States we don't have industrial policy anymore. Um, you know, like my entire professional career has been shaped by decisions made in the 1980s and carried forward, where we basically abandoned industrial policy as a nation state. Um, the sectors people are more familiar with of electronics and networking and information technology, they all were built and benefited from nation state level industrial policy that was quite sophisticated and quite significant domestically. And so and so the situation we're in is that it's really the private capital, the investment markets that are determining how how the resources are flowing to sculpt the forms of technology that get developed. Um, And and so let me read it back in a a complementary way. Um, Technology is not technology. It depends on the form of the technology. So to your point, a computer is not a computer. It depends on who can use the computer where for what purpose. In the 1960s, we had industrial computers. In the 1970s, we prototyped the personal computer. The personal computer is not a revolution in transistor physics. It's not a revolution in in the word computer. It's the the personal part is the revolution. Um, So so my sense is um, we're going to get personal biomakers or the pb in addition to the pc but i think it's going to come from from the entrepreneurial uh, uh activity and 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 the private capital sources to prototype that absent some big change in how the united states is operating like maybe we'll get industrial policy again um but but it's been a 20-year uphill battle for example like here's 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 a here's a postcard regardless of what you think is happening in the market today, do you think DNA is important as an object? Yes. Yeah, and that's because it like encodes all of living systems, right? Like everything we care about that's alive and all of the bioeconomy is built, built with DNA. So, so I could keep going. I could say like DNA is the industrial polymer of the 21st century. It's, it's gotta be the most important one. If, if not, it's certainly gonna compete for it. It's like. What is our what is our what is our strat- what is our collective strategy for DNA? If if we would con- like we thought of computing as being important, we had strategic computing initiatives. Do we if we think of DNA as important, what's our strategic DNA initiative? We don't have one. 
it's insane, right? And like, it's a collectively nuts. Um, so what this means is it defaults into the private marketplace. Um, my, my first briefing of the DARPA director in 2003 contributed to the cancellation of public funding for better DNA printing because it was only perceived as causing bioterror risk, um, not, as, not as being beneficial. Yet 20 years later, it's the synthetic RNA vaccines built on DNA synthesis that are saving the day. Um, so so we, 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 we desperately do need strategic policy around these emerging techs and collectively in the public realm, we don't right now. And so the investment community, right, both retail and other, are, are, the, are the people who are shaping the forms of technology that emerge. Um, so you're asking, like, how soon until we got the PB? Basically, as soon as somebody decides to go invest in it, there's, there's no, like, first principle physics law that makes it impossible. The, the value of the platform so created would be much richer when we get to full understanding of a cell. Um, you know, because then you could download content and plug it in and it would work the first time as opposed to turning into a research project that you have to do tinker and test. Um, so, so a lot of pieces have to fit together. I can say it differently. Let me try and summarize. Synthetic biology is a teenager. Like it's, it's 18 years old. It's about to become an adult and go into the world. And this is the decade that it's happening. There are many experiments happening, both laboratory experiments and business experiments. But, but this, is, this is the decade where synthetic biology goes from demonstrations of being real to it's gonna become whatever it's gonna become. Um, and, and, and there are a lot of examples of failures, but there are enough examples of successes that keep piling up that are hard to ignore. Um, I can give you an example of an, I'll give you an academic example, and, and I'll use one that I know well, so I'll admit to my conflict. So this is, um, this is a project from my wife's lab at Stanford, Christina Smolke, and her student, Prashant. And, and so in October of last year, they published a, an academic paper in Nature showing that they could make scopolamine by brewing. So scopolamine is a drug for treating motion sickness, like if you have a patch on your neck, uh, you know, um, or, or some, sometimes it's used, I understand, for Parkinson's. So this, this natural product chemical used as a medicine, scopolamine, we normally get it from uh, growing plants, plants from the nightshade family. So you grow up a plant and you extract the chemical and then it goes into the medicine. Prashant showed how you could reprogram the biochemistry of baker's yeast or brewer's yeast. Instead of taking in sugar and making ethanol, wine, it makes, takes in sugar, it makes scopolamine. Um, if you look at that paper, there are only two authors on that paper, Prashant and Christina. And this is somebody doing uh, an enzymatic pathway that's 30 or 35 different components. One person was able to do that um, because we got coordination of labor, reusable parts, abstraction, synthesis. Um, if, if one graduate student is able to do that in the year 2020, Right. And then we'll see if Christina and her company can bring it to market successfully or not. You know, it just it just there's there's plenty of examples like that showing up. I think there's a lot of business risk for sure. Um, but but the reality is falling into place. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, let's let's stick with distributed biology. You brought up some good points. It's not just necessary personalized as revolutionary, but um, this also affects maybe, you know, geopolitical concerns uh, across borders as well. Um, yeah. So, you know, oftentimes in biotechnology, I'm always fascinated. It's almost like there's this first mover disadvantage sometimes, right? Um, one example might be like, uh, you know, CAR T cells. 10 years ago, we thought they were God's gift to biotech. And now we're kind of like seeing some of the limitations in manufacturing or toxicities. And we're kind of already investing in things like natural killer cells or bi-specific antibodies. So in, in 10 years, it went from amazing, we can cure cancer with this potentially to now like, well, let's invest in some other stuff. Um, I think synthetic biology is, I mean, that's moving so quickly. I mean, are, are there any first mover disadvantages to some of the companies in this space? I mean, they're making giant investments in these centralized facilities and robotics labs, uh, or even like twist bioscience, right? Um, what if enzymatic synthesis comes out? Um, so like you said, it's, it's not necessarily, they can't adapt. It's a yes. And maybe, um, but you know, yeah, I mean, let me, so this is a good point. So let's use DNA synthesis in that sector quickly. Right. So, so um, we're talking about twist, right? Which is an ongoing concern. 
but I had involvement in two companies before that, right? Uh, Codon Devices and Gen 9, also operating in gene synthesis. And um, one of the things I can share from those experiences is some of the complexities of operating in the marketplace, right? So for example, if you're building genes and your customers would like the price to be cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, right? Let's say you're going from when we started Codon, $4 a base pair, and we're trying to get to four cents a base pair. That means the cost of your products going down by a factor of 100. To make the same top line revenue, the volume through your factory has to go up by a factor of 100. So you're doing 100 times more work to make the same top line revenue. How's, how's Wall Street going to like that? What? You know, like, like, it's like, where's the growth? Uh, well, it's growth in volume, but not growth in revenue. And, and so, you know, if you, if you misprice your contracts a little bit, you're like, well, our cogs are going to get better and better and better. So we're going to win this contract by like losing some money for the first six months of the contract, but making it up when we reduce our cogs on the last 48 months of the contract. You know, like if that's a, that's a reasonable thing to do on your sales team. But if you mistime that a little bit, you cash out. Your runway's gone, right? Um, and and so um, it's a it's a really you're basically making a commodity product that's a customized commodity product. It's always going to be DNA, but the sequence is always going to be a little different. It's like a really interesting business to be in with very interesting market dynamic challenges. So um, you know, I defer to you as the expert on the financial sheets. But one of the things I like about Twist is um, when I look at their financial reporting, I think it was somewhere around 2018 to 2019, they're reporting their revenue and their cost of revenue. And, and around 2018 to 2019, the cost of their revenue was less than the revenue earned. Now, of course, they're still losing money because they're doing all sorts of other things, but it, but it appeared to be the case that the core of the business became profitable you know, a few years ago. Um, and and like I view that as as a major qualitative accomplishment for the business. They still have to grow and become profitable overall, but it means that there's something working in the core that's that's valid. Um, I defer to you and others, right, to understand that better. But but I you know it's like I I, I look at it, it's like how much does it cost you to do what you're doing, and how much money are you making by doing what you're doing, and what's your what's your net relationship with money? Are you making money or are you just spending money? And, and so I'm, I'm looking for those transition points in the, in the businesses, right? Like when do they change their relationship with money? Because those are the things that are going to be ongoing concerns because they're just going to have free revenue, right? To reinvest. Um, yeah. but, but, I, but I do want to acknowledge like the, the, like the trickiness of navigating this from a market dynamic perspective. Yeah, we, we've, uh, that was one of the things in, the, in the, the first wave of companies with biofuels, right? They chose the wrong markets. The tech wasn't there. I mean, I remember touring, yeah. touring Solozyme and they had, rows and rows of like five and 10 liter reactors. Like you can't, that's not going to work, right? Now we've scaled that down to mini bioreactors at 250 milliliters or smaller in, in some applications. Um, so Twist is a, a, an interesting example. And, uh, you know, they're, they're scaling the business. They're going pretty quick, um, profitable or gross profit anyway, investing a lot of money to continue scaling. They have a lot of cash, so that's good. Uh, I mean, I, I think because of the investments they're making that they might not be, uh, profitable for a while, like operating income, but, um, but yeah, nailing down the business models here uh, has still been a challenge and remains a challenge, even for like Zymergen or Ginkgo Bioworks. Um, you know, we like Ginkgo, they're, they're trying to be like the AWS of, uh, you know, uh, biotech or synthetic biology. And I'm not sure the R and D revenue models perfect. You know, you really do have to commercialize products at the end of the day. Uh, so there is that mismatch still of, you know, we, uh, getting the tech and the R&D down and then actually in the market, there's certain things that Wall Street cares about uh, that are quite a bit different. Yeah. From I, I want to I come back and, and talk about Ginkgo a little bit because I'm curious how you see it. Um, but but I, let, me, let me offer a comment about Twist, right? So like from outside of Twist, I'm a customer of theirs, right? I used to be a competitor, right, with Gen 9 and Twist competing. But what Gen 9 got acquired by Ginkgo, and, and so I have a little bit of equity in Ginkgo, incidentally, when, when we get to that. So, so I'm long Ginkgo, right, just to disclose. <laughs> um, but, um, um, you know, in, in addition to being a customer of Twist, in addition to appreciating that when I look at the core of the business, yeah, they're still losing money, but they've got a core that, at least as they're representing it on the financial seat, looks promising, and the growth is really impressive. There's another thing I can say honestly about Twist, and this links back to some of our earlier talking points. Um, if I'm talking to somebody in the United States Senate, a senator, 
I'm going to say that without blinking, because I really mean it, Twist is a national strategic asset for the United States of America. What else do we got? Right? Like, like it's, it's our best high throughput domestic onshore DNA synthesis platform. So, so in addition to everything else that's happening, with a straight face to anybody, I'm going to say this is a national strategic asset. So we have to do everything. When Twist came to me and said, we need to raise your prices a little bit, I said, good. <laughs> because I want you to be an ongoing concern, right? I'm not, you know, just great. Like, make sure you're still around. So that's that's a pretty strange situation to be in, um, and and I don't value that, but I but I definitely there's definitely value there. Um, so um, if we talk about Ginkgo, should we talk about Ginkgo a little bit? Yeah, well, just to stay with Twist for a little bit, we can go to Ginkgo yeah. real quick oh, next. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's interesting, right? So like for some of these valuations, it is interesting. And I, I observed like when when Ginkgo announced they were going public. Wall Street has absolutely no idea how to think about Ginkgo Bioworks. They don't have frameworks. They don't have models. They have no idea what they're, you know, like they're, they're totally lost. So that's interesting to me because it suggests that there might be an opportunity if there is a mismatch in the understanding of the business and then what's possible five or 10 years from now. And I yeah. see the same with Twist. Like you said, it's, it's the only player in the game. So that does suggest well, it needs a premium. Um, yeah. And, and let's be a little bit careful, right? So what game are they playing? They're playing the high throughput most affordable DNA synthesis at the core of their DNA synthesis offering. There are other people in the space like IDT, Integrated DNA Technologies, right? But but Twist is really the person, the, the the corporation doing the high throughput, high volume, low cost fab. And and so I I when I look forward into the DNA synthesis space, you know we're just in generation one two of DNA synthesis technology. You can you can project out five generations. There's going to be enzymatic synthesis. Right and and so on and so forth. I don't view enzymatic synthesis of displacing what Twist is doing as high throughput, low cost. I, th I think I think there's room in the market for multiple form factors of of synthesis, and you'll have centralized high throughput synthesis complemented by distributed local synthesis. Um, you know, just like there's many different types of computer offerings, right? There'll be many different types of DNA print offerings. Um, you know, you'd have an industrial printer. You have your desktop printer. They're all printers, but they're different printers, and everybody can make a good good, good market by differentiating. That's an interesting um, point, I because uh, they they tend to get that question a lot, and I've had that question. You know, what happens when enzymatic synthesis comes up? Twist might just transition to that, but there's multiple. Yeah, there's room the, for more. The, 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 yeah, and the answer, in my view, the answer is great. Like it, great, and Twist will keep growing their core industrial print business because the world will need industrial print. Um, period. Full stop. Will the world also need local print? Absolutely. Um, you know, if Twist keeps growing revenue and whatnot, you know, these emerging these emerging things will be easy acquisitions, right? So, so like one one of the things that goes on in the DNA synthesis business is everybody everybody focuses on the synthesis part, like how you actually organize the atoms into the polymer. But if you want to scale your synthesis business, one of the things you also have to do is you have to organize the bits. The information, right? So, so a, a viable synthesis business, the bits and the bases have to flow together, and and if you have like the world's best um, DNA printer, but you're using Google Sheets to manage all your orders, and you don't have good IT, you're dead because you won't scale. And and most of the most of the companies in the space always focus on the physical operation first, and completely miss the complexity of scaling the IT. Um, and 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 like Twist navig Twist got hit with that. They navigated it successfully. Through their acquisition of Genome Compiler Corporation and so on, but but it, you know it's like a classic like you, we get the physical stuff working like oh my gosh we have to handle IT, so so you know it's a tricky space to operate in and I think if enzymatic happens, you know maybe Twist buys into it or they just keep going it won't matter, um, you know to what they're doing, um, yeah. yeah. So yeah. if, if we that's oh great. So, so sorry, sorry but I but I do I, you make a good point right so it's like. <clears throat> Right before the pandemic, we worked with um, the White House to do America's Bioeconomy Summit, right, in, in late 2019. And this was under the auspices of the Office of Science Technology Policy. So it's the nerd side of the White House, the science and technology side of the White House. And, and we're having the Bioeconomy Summit. S see, see how there's something funny going on there with words? The nerds are having a summit at the White House about the economy. Aren't there other people at the White House who handle the economy? Yeah, the economists. So, so why is it that we're not having the biotechnology summit? Why do we have to call the nerd thing the bioeconomy summit? 
And, and in part, it's because people don't understand biotechnology, to your comment about, about Wall Street, right, and how to think about things. And, and um, it's, it's, it's interesting to acknowledge that puzzle um, and, and, and just recognize that, you know, I'm grateful to be here today. Um, you know, I'm sure some people are hearing this and are going, what's this guy talking about? Uh, but, but like a lot more of that is welcome because I, I think the reality is, uh, you know, people talk about the 21st century being the bio century. They're right. But but we're in the third decade of the bio century. We can't be we can't be like hiding it under other things like economy. We have to be talking about the economy and the reality of it too. Um, and and so I just want to acknowledge that puzzle and and would welcome anybody wanting to work on that more. Uh, like let let's become mutually literate, um, uh, you know, about the ec economics and the technology together. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, uh, I saw it once in a talk years ago. You know. We talk about like genomics and proteomics and transcriptomics. And one of the most difficult omics is economics. <laughs> so <laughs> I love it. Um, that's something. Now sticking with that, with you know, the industrialization of biology, or maybe it's more accurate to say the biologicalization of industry, um, like Ingo Bioworks, right? Or, or Zymergen. Um, so these are big centralized robotic labs. Uh, they'll do your R&D for you. And these are companies that maybe uh, traditionally don't have that investment, like uh, flavor and fragrance companies or... Uh, specialty chemical companies, they don't have, they're not set up for biotech. Uh, so you can maybe have a contract with Ginkgo or Zymogen or whoever uh, to make some ingredients, pay them for the R&D and so on. Um, so you said you want to talk about that. I guess just my high level thoughts. Um, so they're going to go public through a SPAC is the plan. I'm sure that was negotiated in more favorable times for growth stocks. Um, I'm curious to see how that holds up if they, you know, in the coming months, if they do go public, but it was a $15 billion valuation. So like a hundred times sales and it's, not just about sales. I think it's the type of sales. So that non-recurring R&D revenue is going to be tough, I think, on Wall Street. Uh, but, you know, I, the way I read it, I think Ginkgo optimized for the capital raise. So they're going to get $2.5 billion in cash uh, in addition to whatever they have right now. And they're already one of the best funding companies out there. So they're burning a lot of money, making a lot of investments. But $2.5 billion in cash is no joke. So uh, I don't know if you want to weigh in on anything with the uh, how they're pursuing that or what's ahead for them but yeah i mean and, and let me just be let me just be straight right um <clears throat> right so as mentioned through the ginkgo's acquisition of a company i helped start years ago gen 9 i have a little bit of equity in ginkgo um you know two of the founders were my phd students at mit including jason the ceo and, and barry canton um you know, but but I'm not inside Ginkgo, right? So I just want to admit to that too. And and so anything I would have to offer, are um, you know just how I how I sort of see things overall. I, I thought your analysis on Twitter, um, you know, hit a lot of marks. Um, you know, they're 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 getting a lot of capital. When I look at their burn rate, the capital they have is a is a decade of runway. Um, now they probably have ambitions that you know would 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 take off faster than that for sure. But that's that's a lot of freedom to operate. Um, some other things I can observe about Ginkgo, um, and, and at a personal level, I'm actually quite proud of this from afar. Um, how many companies, when the pandemic hit, actually changed what they were doing to help? Yeah, that's true. Not very, not very many. And so, and so what do you make of the fact that you've got this company that actually was agile enough at the scale they're operating to do things to help? Right, like help with making the RNA vaccines and help with backstopping uh, testing for public schools across the country. Like, holy cow. So, so there's a signal there that there's something about this organization. If you just like didn't know anything about the organization, you're looking at an organization that's a corporation that's agile enough to on the dime, like actually make contributions to society in an emergency. Um, and, and, and so there's, there's, there's a, there's just like, I just didn't see that very much. Like I didn't see other companies in the biotech space who could have done stuff like that, doing stuff like that. So, so, so that's, that's kind of interesting. Uh, and I, I think I'm being understated. It suggests that it suggests that this team knows how to operate a pretty sophisticated team of hundreds of people to do useful things. Um, so let me, let me zoom out and come back in. Um, when Ginkgo was getting started, like nobody knew what to think about Ginkgo. I remember, you know, like I remember when they were leaving the laboratory and I was like, what, what are they, what are they going to do? They didn't know. Right. And of course this is like over a decade ago, you know, and I remember talking with Tim O'Reilly, like, should he invest in Ginkgo? I'm like, I have no idea. What are they going to do? You know, and, and, and Jason makes a lot of fun, uh, of me for that one. Right. Cause that wasn't good advice to Tim. Um, 
uh, on my part. Now, the first innovation I saw with Ginkgo, and I think you've touched upon this, is, is not a technical innovation, but a business innovation. And, and it's the fact that they've defined the product as the organism. I still remember coming from a workshop in DC and Jason was very clear, like adamant. He's like, the organism is the product. I go, what are you talking about? He goes, the organism is the product. I'm like, okay, right? And, and, and the context for that statement is Amaris and what becomes Zymergen. So I should also disclose, I have exactly one share of Amaris, which I have bought at a basis of $30. <laughs> um, and, and I bought that share so I could speak as a shareholder of Amherst to the board of Amherst. Um, it didn't work at the time, but I tried. And, and so Amherst invested in their, um, their rapid yeast strain engineering platform, RISE, automated strain engineering, beautiful platform, hundreds of millions of dollars. And they didn't let anybody else use it. Only Amherst could use it. And I remember talking with Lynn Conway, who we discussed before, Lynn opened up access to the chip fabs. And so I asked Lynn, how did, you, how did you convince the companies who had invested in the silicon fabs to let other people run processes on their fabs? And she immediately wrote back with seven rationalizations that she used to open up access to the chip fabs, you know, back in the 80s. And I immediately forwarded that into Amaris to the founders, right? Like, you got to open up your fab, right? And, and, and here, here's what Lynn says about it. Could, we couldn't get that to happen. And, and so basically my view of Amherst, and this is, this is not Amherst today, this is Amherst in its first generation. They overcapitalized in the fabrication platform relative to what that platform could support in the market because, because the product was the ultimate product used in the marketplace. So, so when Ginkgo says the organism is the product, they're putting a business to business interface in place and wrapping up their offering so that you might have a chance of getting scaling downstream. Let's come back and talk about that in a minute. So, so, so the first innovation in Ginkgo, in my mind, like really significant innovation is a business innovation, defining their product as an organism and not trying to own all of that, letting other people, other corporations benefit from that. That is a radical, that was, that was and remains a radical uh, approach. Zymergen attempted this in their initial instantiation, but has pivoted to vertical now, so far as I can tell. I'm not inside Zymergen, but they seem to have gone more traditional to sort of own, own up, so to speak. Would you agree with that? Yeah, they, they're scaling in certain verticals. I bet they're going to come back around, maybe open it up a little bit. But uh, they're, I think their pivot is to what markets they're focusing on. So that's a little yeah. bit different for Zymergen. But yeah, yeah. That, that would be yeah. correct. And that'll be really interesting. Like that, that'll be really interesting if they loop back. Um, so, so if I if I think about if I think about Zymergen or Ginkgo um, as an experiment with risk, like where are the risks? You know, it, it seems to me like there are two big risks. Um, one of the risks is it's easy to prototype biology that demonstrates you can do something, but then you have to actually bring that to market. So I could prototype something in a laboratory, but, but that's not going to earn me revenue. What's going to earn me revenue is like an actual manufacturing process that actually results in people buying something and using it, right? And, and so that, that downstream set of activities, um, you know, you could have the best bioworks in the world that's doing the prototyping, right in Boston but if you don't have something that's going to scale to go to market good luck right so so that's one thing that limits scaling the other thing that limits scaling at least i used to think this would be um property rights and patent claims um like if you're doing high throughput fabrication like how do you get freedom to operate on all the things you're doing because there's patents all over the place in biotech so 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 long ago i'm looking at ginkgo and i'm going okay these are going to be the two major risks uh, like property rights claims and scaling of the downstream downstream processing going to market, how are they managing those risks? Well, the property rights claims you can manage with money. And, and, and so that actually is not trivial. It's actually pretty easy to solve if you have money. Like you can basically buy freedom to operate and they appear to be doing that well. Um, so so I, I think they've solved that problem um, and, and um, that's pretty good. So, th so then the remaining, the remaining risk or problem so far as I see it is is the scaling of the going to market, right? So if you've got your bioworks and you can prototype out the wazoo, how do you make sure you're getting into the real world at scale? And this is where um, the architecture of the organism as the product combined with their JV approach um, and other things like that seems, seems like another innovation within the corporation. Um, I think there's some, I, I see that there's ambiguity. It's like, how do we value this stuff, right? Uh, you know, as, as a potential investment. Uh, how do we how do we evaluate equity stakes in other biotech startups, 
right, and, and other sorts of partnerships. Um, I'm going to let you and others like solve that problem. But but what I like what I like about it, like because I think that problem is going to get solved ultimately, right? But but what I like about it is it seems like the architecture of the solution is correct, right? In other words, if if you're if you're one company and you try to do all the scale up and go to market, good luck. You just can't scale that. But if you create an ecosystem that allows many people to work together with you on the scale up, then and going to market, I think that's plausible. Um, I think I think that's the best in class approach. Um, there'll be market there'll be market dynamic questions on how it plays out, but I think it will work. It's just a question of, you know, how long does it take to play out? But I, th I think I think they've got the right business to business architecture. Let me let me see it. Let me, I'll just pause there. I have one more thing to say about it that might help make sense of it. But what do you, what do you think? Yeah, I think you're right. So maybe to summarize that, um, you know, we had bottlenecks in synthetic biology. We've kind of been kicking them further downstream with all every advance, right? Every so many years. So it's no longer in like, um, you know, working with DNA necessarily or sequencing. It's no longer really an R&D. I mean, there's still bottlenecks, of course, right? Uh, kind of there's like data bottlenecks now. You're generating so much data. How do you work with it all? Uh, and now like the biggest, most obvious bottleneck that's remaining is still the scale up in the manufacturing. Um, I, I mean, that's my background, right? Is scaling up fermentation. Uh, yep. On the one hand, like in biologic drugs, we, we see a lot of, you know, uh, contract development manufacturer organizations, CDMOs coming out and that's becoming more, more popular, right? Drug developers want to focus on clinical trials and then hand off the manufacturing to someone else. Uh, maybe we see that in biology. I don't see necessarily uh, the proper amount of thought or investment in the manufacturing side of things yet. We still need like a ginkgo level event for manufacturing, in my opinion. And I think right now, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know if we can decouple that yet uh, i mean i know there's companies out there working on it right but um like zymogen for instance not to poo poo them but like they hired people to run their manufacturing teams that worked at like apple and lego and like that's not how you do it like what are you guys doing you know maybe that can help with procurement of, of uh, starting materials and things but you need people who understand biology to be in charge of your biomanufacturing in my opinion um but but yeah i think you you hit it on the head so that's kind of like so let me I, hey, let me let me read that back because I, I think you're right on target, right? So it's like one thing that's really important to note is is the workflow had bottlenecks uh, that were just in the R and D and prototyping at the bench, and then other parts. And 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 if I read back what you're saying, we're at the final bottleneck now. It's the bottleneck of scale up and go to market for the whole sector, right? And so that's that's the problem that's getting solved now. And if we loop all the way back, you know, some of the fundamental stuff like operational mastery of the cell, that's getting solved too. But but from a from a on the marketplace right now, we're now hammering away at the final bottleneck. Ginkgo's got this approach, which is which is scaling through partnership, hammering away at that. I want to I want to pull back from Ginkgo for a second and hammer on something bigger than that. You know, so you're making a great point, and and remember, we're operating without industrial policy as a nation, right? So so we should probably you know we had the interstate system, we should have the biostate system, we should be building biofermentation, biomanufacturing capacity in every district of the House of Representatives, 435, right? We should have the bio belt. Um, we should be spending $25 billion a year on domestic biomanufacturing capacity. And 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 not just the, the physical plant, but the people who know how to do it, right? So that, like people who are actually skilled at operating these facilities and making high value products that are high quality, we, we are not like educating that, that group of people at the scale we need. Um, and so, you know, I had a really interesting call with a with a mid cap firm out of Boston. They were observing what was happening in the sector, and they had done very well over the last couple of decades um, in the information net sector by investing in the support industries, the 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 things needed to make a data center work. Like, what are all the businesses that exist in support of data centers? Right? What are all the businesses in support of the internet, like the Cisco, right? Um, you know, but 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 things things that most people will never hear about because they're just they're just kind of they need to be there. They're part of the infrastructure from a business perspective, and they make a lot of money. They don't make they don't make hundred fold, hundred thousand fold return, but they make they make like twenty percent growth year on year on year in perpetuity. Um, you know, so that was pretty interesting. That 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 type of investor was appearing and anticipating. That, that the bioeconomy developing this decade was going to have opportunity for business that was in support of, of scaling the bioeconomy. 
and 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 I think that's right. And I, 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 you know, I wish it was complemented by smarter public policy, and we're working on that, but we don't have it right now. So, so I just want to, I just want to acknowledge that. Um, yeah, in, in one of your recent interviews, that's a good point. Um, you know, you said we operate with this idea that biology is something that happens to us. Yeah. It's not something we act upon, and that really needs to change in order for us to have you know, a national strategy on the bioeconomy. And that is, that is the economy. It's not the bioeconomy. Like one day, one day we're going to drop the prefix. You know, if you, if you remember from ethanol in the early days, in the early two thousands, we used to say bioethanol. We don't say bio anymore. We just say ethanol. How else are you going to make it? Right. I think, you know, hopefully my grandkids will be like, yeah, grandpa, how else would we make concrete? It's not bio concrete, dude. Like, what are you doing? Um, so that change in mindset is really important. I think. It's, I, I'm with you 100%. Um, uh, it reminds me of the Semiconductor Research Corporation's Synthetic Biology Roadmap from late 2018. So, so Semiconductor Research Corporation, like Intel, Fairchild, Qualcomm, like why do they have a Synthetic Biology Roadmap? And it's, it's exactly to your point. Um, they believe in 30 years that Tom Knight was correct and we're gonna be growing inorganic computers. And, and we're not gonna call it the bioeconomy. It's just gonna be like, this is how we do stuff. Um, but, but what's amazing to me about that roadmap is it's not just this fantasy from 30 years out in the future. It's this is what we're doing this year and next year and next five years and then the next five years. It's a very plausible roadmap with intermediate deliverables in the marketplace like data storage, you know, abiotic data storage into DNA tape um, as, a, as, an, as, an, as an earlier possibility. But then what's also confusing to me um, is, um, you know, it's not happening. Like that that one roadmap from the SRC would seem to imply we should be, just in the United States, investing about $6 billion a year in R&D to make that roadmap come true. And to the best of my knowledge, we're not. Um, so so you, could either, you could either like complain about that or just go, wow, that's a kind of interesting opportunity, right? If the whole, if the whole semiconductor sector believes this is the future and it's not being invested in right now, if we can find the right opportunities along the way, there's just like sustained growth opportunities for the next three decades that happens to get to the future we want um, for, our, for everything. Let, let me read it back just one thing at a high level that may be helpful. Um, as, a, as a corporeal being, as a human, I need three things from a first principles physics perspective. I need energy, I need knowledge, and I need stuff. I need jewels, J-O-U-L-E-S, I need bits, <laughs> and I need atoms, okay? And I can quantify how much joules, bits, and atoms I need, and we can quantify that for the whole of civilization. And so if I'm thinking about investment and I'm thinking about society, not only is this true for me, it's true for all of us. Like how much energy does civilization need? 20 terawatts, right? And we're gonna need more. Um, so that's, you know, it's like, how are we getting the joules? How are we getting the bits? How are we getting the atoms? The synthetic biology sector, well, biology operates at the intersection of joules, bits, and atoms at a local scale and a planetary scale. And if you're investing in the synthetic biology sector, it's, a, it's an investment in the thing that's using energy and information to wrangle atoms, right? So it's an investment in the atoms platform, the atoms wrangling platform. Um, yeah, so it's, 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 yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, so, so like, does your portfolio have blended balance across the jewels, bits and atoms sectors? Or are you only investing in the bits or jewels sector? And, and the bio play is sort of an investment in all three, but certainly uh, weighted into the atoms. That's a great analogy. I love it. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, if, and it also sort of depends on what future you want to live in for you and your family. Do you want to live in a future that's jo j j dominated by jewels and bits and you're going to digitize your body? Good luck with that. Uh, and live in the cloud? Or are you actually going to live in reality, a corporeal three-dimensional reality with atoms? In which case you probably want to be supporting biotech. <laughs> yeah, I, I prefer that future. Yeah, well, I, just I, want to, I, I just want to acknowledge where, where I live, not everybody, you know, there's two tribes out here in this regard. There's the tribe of jewels and bits who want to digitize the brain and, and that's not going to work. And then there's the tribe of jewels, bits and atoms, which I'm part of. Um, so anyway. Well, I support your tribe, Drew. <laughs> All right. I, uh, I significantly underestimated how much time we might go. I know you have a hard stop soon. So maybe just to close it out, um, we've kind of touched on some of these, but just to remain objective, you know, what are some of the, the bigger challenges and, or challenges and obstacles facing synthetic biology? 
Uh, we touched on some of these, so maybe economic or societal or technical or political or whatever it might be, uh, just to give readers a little uh, dose of objectivity here. We've, we've covered them, so let's just read them back, but try and get it clear. Um, at a fundamental level, we don't understand the basic unit of life, the cell, completely. We know a lot about it. We're about two-thirds done, but we got one-third to go. And this is the decade where the fundamental unit of life, the cell, gets figured out well enough to build cells. That completely unlocks building with biology. And so you should anticipate um, significant qualitative change in what becomes possible. Even though many things are now possible, many more things are going to become possible. So this is a very dynamic uh, space and dynamic market that's deeply coupled to fundamental investment in tooling and fundamental science. So, so pre be prepared to be surprised, right, uh, in, a, in positive ways. Um, a second thing we touched upon is, you know, it's one thing to demonstrate something in an academic paper or another thing to demonstrate something in a startup you know, that's, that's an incremental demonstration, but it's a whole other thing to bring that into the marketplace. You know, when, when you write software and you demonstrate your app to your team and your startup, you can ship that as bits and it goes out on infrastructure that scales. When I demonstrate something in bio, and, and of course it's encoded by DNA, I ultimately have to bring atoms to market, not just bits. And so there's a whole physical scaling process of bringing the atoms to market at the scale, the actual stuff, the matter is needed. And so there's opportunities to support that economically and make money. But also when you look at the companies that are um, betting on scaling, think carefully about how they're scaling their capacity to wrangle atoms, to manufacture stuff, and, and what their solution is to that puzzle. And I think we correctly identified that is the last big uh, puzzle to solve, to, 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 you know, to unleash to unleash the, 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 the promise of first-gen synthetic biology. Um, there's a couple other things which we've touched upon. We have a hard time as a society talking about biotechnology for reasons that are valid. Um, you know, uh, I have a class we teach in the D school out here and we do, um, uh, I used to think and now I think exercise with the students. And um, one of our students this last quarter, she said, I used to think that emerging technologies happened to me, and now I think that I happen to emerging technologies. In other words, she, she acquired agency and became a protagonist with respect to constructing a future she could love. Um, with biotechnology, I think we've inherited a lot of dysfunction from the first generation of genetic engineering, GMOs, bioethics, this and that. Um, we need to learn how to fall in love with biotechnology. And, and the country that wins the geopolitical race of biotech is going to be the country that figures out the cultural puzzle of falling in love with biotechnology. As an aside, this is one of the things that's pretty interesting about Ginkgo. Um, you know, they're operating um, cultural products. Their magazine, Grow, um, is a really interesting product. They are, they are doing the work that IBM did to explain to people what computers were and what a business machine would be in the 1940s, right? So, so Ginkgo, is shipping, Ginkgo is shipping not just product that's like the actual atoms you're using, they're also, they're also shipping cultural product. That's, that's crazy rare. Um, so, so, so falling in love with biotechnology as a culture seems pretty important. Now there's one more thing which we didn't touch upon at all. And I'm not, should we, this is like the, the one more thing bonus topic. Should we do it or not? Let's do it, lay it on me. Oh God, okay. <laughs> so. So this comes back to urgency and, and things that uh, your comment about first mover disadvantage. Um, so, so, you know, people, people use past experience to project, right? And everybody knows the caveats. With emerging technology, one of the, one of the, com one of the cliches is Moore's law, you know, the exponential increase in computer power. And so that's appeared in genomics and synthetic biology because of improvements in DNA sequencing and synthesis. And, and so when you're operating in a Moore's law domain, one of the things you think about from a competitiveness perspective is keeping up. So the, the core of Moore's law is your, your, your better computer will help you make a better computer, will help you make a better computer. That better tools help make better tools, help make better tools, and that piles on and gets that exponential 
amplification. And, and if you fall behind on an exponential, it becomes harder to catch up because the people in the lead accelerate away from you. And, and so this, this triggers this sort of um, urgency around keeping up on an exponential. And, and that's certainly a tr true in a way in, in synthetic biology, but I think completely misses the point. So um, the other laws that are at play in synthetic biology and biotechnology and the bioeconomy more broadly are related to networking strategy. Um, so, so networking strategy is how people act in relation to each other and how value is created on the basis of how people are connected and act in relation to each other. And the, the, two, the two laws that I think are most are Metcalf's law and Joy's law. So Metcalf after Bob Metcalf, the, the value of the network is the square of the nodes connected on the network. Um, if we're just talking, we have some value, but now if a third person could talk to either of us, they get to talk to, we each get to talk, you know, have two more conversations and so on. And it just keeps going up with that square exponential. Um, Joy's law is a little bit more subtle. It's an observation that most people don't work for your company. So most of the labor that create value for your company, you don't give them a paycheck. And it, it begs a question, what do you do about that? How do you exploit that reality that most people don't work for your company? So Ginkgo in its early form, if we just use them as a case study, they were using the rhetoric of Moore's law. You know, DNA printing is getting a lot better. We're buying most of the DNA print capacity in the world, you know, bigger, 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 faster, faster exponential improvements. But what's actually impressive is they're, impl they're implementing network strategy. They're creating a coordination solution, which is where people go to get the biology they want. Um, and so coordination strategies appear within networks and the interesting thing about coordination strategies is what's, once they form, they're very hard to displace. You know, I, I give you an example from academia. The number one law school in the United States of America is in New Haven, Connecticut at Yale. Why is that? It's because the, the college students who want to go to law school don't know who the other best students are going to be. And even if they could figure out who those people were, you couldn't organize a Zoom meeting and you couldn't get everybody to agree to go to one place, let alone New Haven. Like, really? But instead, so that's called a coordination problem. And so what's emerged over the centuries is the answer to that coordination problem appears. It's Yale Law School, and it solves the problem that the college undergraduates have. So, so another example of a coordination solution is search. Um, where are you going to go to search? Probably Mountain View, you know, probably Google. Um, so as soon as things go on networks, oh, oh, and by the way, just to explain it, anybody who links, this goes back to Joy's Law, Anybody who links a web page to another web page is working for Larry because he's going to create value from that labor, even though he doesn't send them a paycheck. Right. Um, and so, and so it's like, how do you create strategies that benefit your organization from the labor of others create value? Um, Ginkgo is positioning itself, I think, to create coordination solutions on a networked bioeconomy. They may not fully understand this yet, um, but they're doing it. Um, uh, and and I, 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 maybe they do understand. I don't know, but 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 it looks to me like they're 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 implementing a coordination solution. If they pull that off, they won't get displaced. Um, you know, I mean, there might be another coordination solution in China, but you know, pretty much that'll be that. Um, and so that's that's very different than an exponential strategy where you could get displaced because somebody will leap ahead of you and then you're behind. But coordination solutions, if if you become the go-to place to do something, you you've got a you've got a and it's not quite the same as like what I see on the chat boards, like they have a moat. It's like, nah, that's not really a moat. It's just like, it's an immovable object. The coordination solution, once it's entrenched, you just don't move it. Um, yeah, anyway. Well, I know that, so we didn't touch upon that at all, but I just want to emphasize biotech's going on the network. And as soon as the network appears, you get network strategy opportunities. And, 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 and my, my, my prediction is in the year 2030, we're going to be more comfortable using words like the PB, the personal biomaker, and we're going to be more comfortable using words like the bionet, uh, and we'll be more familiar with uh, design anywhere, grow anywhere. Um, but but that'll have to be made true, and that'll all have to be made true right now in the absence of coordinated industrial public policy, and and so it's it's really up to the the, the private investor and the markets to figure out these opportunities in the meantime. Well said. I could talk all day about the Bionet with Drew. So uh, well, thanks for joining me today. And um, 
yeah, where can people find you? Or should they not find you? Leave them alone. You're uh, at Drew Endy on Twitter, I think, right? Yeah, that's that's valid. Um, and um, as you can see, I'm hiding out on campus and avoiding barbers uh, for the foreseeable future. We'll see what happens next. All right. Well, uh, stay safe out there. Hunker down. You're not traveling anymore. So, uh, uh, But we'd love to have you back on the podcast in the future. Uh, Max, really great to connect with you. And I'm um, uh, long grateful for benefiting from your analysis. I really appreciate what you do and, and, and your you know, uh, uh, constructive sense of reality you bring to this important space. So, so I would look forward to uh, talking again. My pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate that.